عزیزانم امیدوارم که هر جا که هستین خوب و خوش و سلامت باشین در یک مجموعه برنامه دیگه در خدمت شما هستیم با درس زندگی واقعا امیدوارم که در هر شرایطی که هستین همونطور که کلام خدا میگه در هر شرایطی شاد باشین و سپاسگزار باشین از اون خدایی که واقعا قادر هستش که ما برای اون چیزهایی که ما حتی تصورش رو میکنیم ما برای اون چیزهایی که ما براش دعا میکنیم خداوند قادر هستش که به ما عطا بکنه پس امیدوارم که واقعا خدایی که خدای امید هست در زندگی های شما عزیزان باشه و امیدوارم که در آرامش کامل باشین امروز در استودیو هستم و یک مهمان عزیزی داریم امروز که واقعا من خودم از حضور ایشون از آشنایی با ایشون خیلی مفتخر هستم و اینکه ازشون واقعا یاد میگیرم ایشون یک منستری یک خدمت خیلی عالی رو در آمریکا دارن که واقعا به همه ما نشون میدن که واقعا شاگرد سازی در مسیح چگونه باید باشه. راس ویلکم. We are so honored to have you on our program. I was just giving our audience a little intro about what the program is about. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you give our audience a little bit of the intro about yourself, your name, how really... Um, um, how really you came up with this ministry of yours that is absolutely fascinating. Well, first, I just want to tell you I'm humbled to be here. And uh, So my name is Ross Ramsey, and uh, about five or six years ago, um, I'm on staff at a local church yes. serving as a discipleship pastor, and I got introduced to some simple tools in how to share the gospel, uh, enter lostness, and begin to make disciples. And then I began to train our church on it, um, I got competent at it, and then I began to train, uh, train our church, and I just began to see the kingdom of God begin to expand in my life and in our church's life. That's just a broad overview, and then about four months ago, God opened an opportunity for me to do this full-time awesome. uh, with churches in the area and around the United States. So. That is amazing. Ross, you and I were uh, speaking about, you know, what you guys do, and for me, like, it's fascinating because as believers, we just... Um, at times, we know the confession of our faith. We know that Jesus is Lord. We know that He, um, that God is sovereign, that the Holy Spirit works through us and in us. But then a lot of times we find ourselves a little um, ashamed I would, I, would, I would use this word cautiously to just go up to strangers and just share the gospel with them. What really gave you that comfort level to just go up and knock on people's doors yeah. and share the gospel? Well, give you, just step back a little bit yeah. here. What I realized six years ago is that we talk about sharing the gospel. Yes. Everyone, everybody in churches will affirm that. Yes. Everybody. But when you really get down to boots on the ground, we're not talking about Jesus with anybody. What we're doing is what we call an attractional approach True. In, in the West. I True. don't know how it is everywhere else. We, go, yeah. we know somebody, and we're going to bring them to a building, yep. and they're going to hear a really sharp guy share the gospel. Right. Right. Well, the problem with that is I have the identity as an ambassador, and I knew that. So all these churches have a vision for sharing the gospel, but they don't have a plan for equipping people. Literally, yes. what am I going to do Monday morning at 8 a.m.? Yes. And so I got exposed to tools and processes that began to equip people like you and me, just yes. like you and me, yes. to go, I can, I'm the one that can open my mouth and actually have that conversation with my neighbor. And that was the whole point of the training is I could go back to the people I love and know who've known me for years and all I've done at best is invite them to church, yes. which is good. Yes. But now I can actually talk to them about Christ in a very biblical, uh, simple way. And when we began to do that, we began to see the kingdom begin to expand in that person's life because they're opening their mouth and they're testifying about Christ. Yeah. Which, uh, oh <laughs> which my is my... Oh gosh, you're alarmed. Yeah. Tell um, us more about the alarm. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> How this actually started for me was I met with some guys that were training, yes. okay? And I was very jaded and skeptical. I just was like, I'm going to hear these guys out yeah. and get out of this meeting. Well, in the middle of the meeting, they interrupt me, and I'm like, right. I'm here to, and, and they say, do you, do you mind if we pray? Oh, wow. It was, it was 10 in the morning, two minutes after 10, so it was 10.02, and I go, well, yeah, sure, I'm not against prayer. Right. And they, they bow their heads and they begin to pray Luke chapter 10, verse 2, which, where Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'd send out laborers into the harvest. Amen. 
Yes. Because the laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. And at that moment, it flipped my heart. Oh, my Lord. That's awesome. God began to use these, and I realized at that moment I wasn't a laborer. And yes. I began from that day forward praying that, that prayer, that simple prayer that Jesus says, pray for laborers. And I realized at that moment, that's my role, is to help raise up laborers to go into the harvest. And that's what I've been doing for six years. And it started with a simple prayer that Jesus told us Amen. to pray. He's telling us to say, ask me for this. Yes. yes. And I said, okay, I'm going to start. And I had messed up motives. I wasn't right, but the sure. heart eventually came. Sure. And he began to answer that prayer in my life. I does that love make sense? It. Oh, absolutely it does. So, it's funny. You said I was ru rudely interrupted when I was in the middle of a conversation. That was pride <laughs> more than anything. I was a jerk at that. But no, they did. I love and that. so, yeah. You know, I love that, Ross, because God meets us where we are. And when you, when I'm telling you, like I've, um, a lot of times we may have our own motives, our own intentions, but God exactly knows where we are and the assignments that he sends to us, the appointments that he sends to us, the divine interruptions that he brings into our lives right. just bring about revolutionary impact so that not only are we impacted by it, so that he can also equip us and empower us so we can go change the world, expand his kingdom. Well, you said a key word there, go. What we found is most Christians never go. Right. Uh, there's this saying in the Baptist is God never steers a parked car. Right. He always steers somebody who's moving. And so what we realized is we had to get people going. Right. And that's part of the door knocking piece that, and by the way, I don't know if you realize this, that this interview is the result of a door knock in, Tell in Colin County. Well, I no, know. it was really simple. That's we awesome. we go out every Sunday night, and we we take that literally. In Luke chapter ten, he sent them out two by two. Yes, and that's where we build up competency and confidence. And so we go out every Sunday night, either at four or six, when the time change, and a team went out. Yes, and knocked on a a, a, a one far, of your staff. You one of your staff? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And they were like, "Oh my goodness, there's people out praying and sharing the gospel." We're like, "Yeah, we do that." And the, the dominoes fell and it ends up here, me in the studio being interviewed by you. But that's how the kingdom works. That's if you awesome. go, you begin to enter into God's activity yes. in, your, in yes. your community. But we have to begin going at some point. Yes. And so that, that's an aspect of our training. We actually train. Yes. And then we physically, we immediately go into the community. Yeah. Uh, and that's when we begin to see the work of God is when we become obedient. That to me is humbling because like you mentioned, Lord, um, you said laborers are few, but the harvest is plenty. Mm -hmm. And I, um, when I think about it, just what the, the magnitude of what you guys do, you not only have trained up yourselves to be laborers, but you're also making disciples. You're also, just like in Matthew 24, make disciples and and send them to all nations so that so that they can also multiply disciples for me yeah so um to me it's just fascinating how you're doing your training and of course um how you're training up people equipping them empowering them and right away you're like you're on a mission field go knock on doors well that's actually what we found in my experience is that the church in the west is a sleeping giant right and there's a bunch of people in the churches, not everybody, who are just like they're on simmer. Yes. They're waiting to be equipped yes. and they're waiting to be shown how to do it. So what, what happens in the West, I, I can't speak for, I, I know the church in America somewhat, sure. is that we talk about a lot of stuff. Right. You need to share the gospel. You yes. need to go do this. And, but they never have someone that goes, here, let me come show you. Yes. And when they see it, it's like the, the scales fall off their eyes and it's a paradigm shift. Yes. And so what we do in our training is we, we lay vision, but we actually go, come and watch me. By the way, you know who did that? Jesus says, yes, did. come and follow me. Yes. Paul, I know of at least three or four times in the epistles where he says, imitate what you see me doing. Yes. And we need to have a process where other Christians are seeing you going and making disciples. A lot of it's just spoken. Yes. So what we brought is a process where we actually see it, yes. and that's when the light comes on, if that makes any oh, sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. why do you think we get into the whole complacency as believers? Because, uh, you're asking me, so I'll be honest, I think we've seen passive consumer Christianity on a leadership level in our church, right. and we only model what we see. Yeah. And the vast majority of 
leaders in our church have not done this. So we follow what we see, and when someone comes along and just says, hey, you've seen this, let's go do something a little bit differently, I think that it begins to catalyze their identity as an ambassador of Christ. And they're kind of waiting for I think in a sense, that there's got to be more than just coming to a building and sitting and listening all day long. I actually can go and, yes. and be on mission. And so you have to show them that. You mentioned we are ambassador of Christ. Yeah. And that's the word of God. And truly, you resemble that by... Be, um, you know, doing what you're doing, the ministry that you're a part of, the way you're training up people to also get in on this mm -hmm. to, for the expansion of the kingdom. That is amazing. Now, I do want us to shift the, um, shift the gears a little bit for the people that are watching in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there is safety issues in Iran, and they can't just go around yeah, and knock right. on doors. So how would you say... Um, people that are watching um, from Iran and they're like, we wish we had this freedom to be able to just go up and knock on people's doors. They're part of the persecuted church yeah, in Iran right. and their, um, their faith as we're hearing it is just so bold and courageous and they do the things that we probably here in the West would shy away from doing. Yeah. So how would you what, how would a, you encourage them? That's a great question. In the training, the, the door knocking is almost, uh, how do I say this? Is This is going to sound like I'm talking on both sides of my, my mouth, but it's secondary. Mm. The, the, the place that we're equipping people to yes. take the gospel back is to their sphere of influence, where they have relationships, yes. where they already have equity with people, yes. right? Yes. And so our equip in the training, we list four names that you're going to go to in a week that you know people that are far from God that right. you've never said anything to. You're going to set an appointment or go there and go, you know, there's something I don't think I've ever told you about this story that's changed my life. That's where we, we really want people to go yes. to. By the way, that's what we see in the book of Acts. Where did Cornelius go to? He went to his family. Yes. Lydia immediately went to her household. The Philippian jailer went to his household. We want to see it go back to relationships. The problem, Lily, is, is that most Christians have been Christians so long that the people they have the closest relationships with, they've never said a word to them for years. Right. And now all of, a long, all of a sudden they come to them and go, hey, listen, I've been a follower of Jesus. And I've never said anything to you about it. Yeah. And we find that that's very difficult for existing believers. Now... Just put it, put my foot in the clutch here. When someone comes to the Lord later in life, it's intuitive yes. for them to go tell people about yes. Christ. When someone's been a Christian their whole life from childbirth, they're the least likely to sure. go back to their sphere of influence. And sure. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. So in the book of Acts, we hear that they had to wait in the upper room for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Mm -hmm. So, And then right after that happened then they were empowered to go and make disciples. Could you share more about that? Yeah, so in Acts chapter 2, uh, uh, well, Acts chapter 2, you see the dropping of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4 is they pray, the Holy Spirit comes down, right? And it shakes the place, and they begin to speak the message of the kingdom with boldness. Yes. And so what we found is that when people begin to open their mouth, now, I realize in Iran, you can't go door to door. Sure, I get that. Sure. But they have relationships. Sphere of influence. Yeah. yeah. And so what happens is, is when we begin to open our mouth in that sphere of relationships, yes. God begins to show us where he's at work. We just have to start with yes. boldness. Yes. Start opening our mouth. But to go back a little bit further, we need a simple gospel tool. Yes. And that's what we found. When we give them a simple way of communicating Christ, it, it, it catalyzes them to go and, and speak that, yes. that message to yes. people. So. Absolutely. The elevator pitch, we call it that. Are you guys doing well, that? Well, we, do, we have two tools. We have a 15-second testimony, which basically is, um, let's say we're in a conversation, and you start to say something like, you know, I'm really down about my marriage, or I'm down about something. And so I cue in on that, and I go, you know, there was a time in my life yes. where I struggled in, in, in my marriage or yes. something like that. But I came to know about the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And now my marriage has shifted a little bit. Yes. Has anything like that ever happened to you? Yes. And what we do is that's a, it's a flipper, right? And then they go, no, I, I've, I've never experienced anything right. like that. Well, 
Let me tell you this story that changed my life. So we're always using our story so to get to God's story. That's so good. Right? That's so and good. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but that's all they had in the Gospels. Yes. Uh, the woman at the well. Hey, she didn't know anything about Jesus other yes. than this guy knows something about me. She went back to a town and said, hey, come know that this guy told me everything about me. Right. And a whole town gets saved. Yes. The garrison demoniac. He's cutting himself. He's living in the tombs. He's naked. This is Mark chapter 5. And he goes back to his town and says, hey, there's this guy, and the whole town comes out. All people had at that point was a simple testimony. I met this guy. Yes. He changed my life. I'm different. Come meet him. Yes. And that is sometimes all people need. Sometimes. Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. So. People connect with stories, especially personal first-hand stories so much better than just, you know, telling them some random things. I have to also be cautious about this. The Word of God has power. Mm -hmm. But then if the Word of God's sitting on my living room table and not being opened and spoken, as you said, there's power when we open up our, our mouths and say the Word of God and share our story or the gospel with people. There is this proactiveness that God um, loves to see. You do your part, and I will prepare people's hearts to hear and receive it. Well, what we were talking about before the, the interview is, is somewhere in the process, I started reading the book of Acts, and I started every time the Holy Spirit's mentioned. Every yes. time. And what I found is what I mentioned to you. Almost yes. four out of six times when the Holy Spirit's mentioned, it's someone opening Open their mouth and testifying about Christ or doing something. And I realized... Maybe we can reverse engineer this. If we start talking about Jesus, maybe it'll catalyze the work of the That's Holy so Spirit good. in our lives. That's so, so good. That Let me give amazing. me an example of that 15 yes. second testimony. The first time I got trained, we call it the 15 second testimony, is uh, real quickly, I was at my son's baseball practice. And this guy moves over, and I'm reading my Bible on a Kindle, and he just starts talking to me, and he won't shut up. I'm just being, and I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm like, the last thing I want to do at my son's baseball practice is talk to me. It's, it's yes. Sunday evening, and I'm, I'm decompressing, and he's like, da, 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 da. Uh, you know, I do, I'm up in Anna and everything, and and he looks at me, <laughs> and but he can tell him, I'm just don't want to talk to this. Sure. Guy. And that's wrong. I would admit that. I was No, hey, I shouldn't who, have been all there. Humans but this guy real. he's in, he's talking to me and he won't shut up and he looks down at my kid and he goes, What are you reading? <laughs> and it was like God hit me with a with a ton of like a bat and he, and he says, Try the fifteen second testimony. So I went, mm. huh. I said, you know, there was a time in my life I never read anything spiritual. Yeah. And I'm reading the Bible and it's because I realized what Christ did for me. I realized the love and forgiveness of him, and I began to follow him. And, and now I'm reading this Bible all the time. And I looked at him. I go, has anything like that ever happened to you? And he looks at me, and all I can tell you is at that moment, he stares at me for about three or four seconds. I felt myself sweating. Yeah. I felt blotches showing up on my neck. You know what was happening? I was dying to my comfort. Yes. And he looks at me, and I'm like, oh, God, where is this going to go? Yeah. And he goes, I do have a story like that. What was crazy about that moment is there was two sets of ladies. There was a lady right here talking to each other, and then there's another set of ladies. And they even stopped talking when oh, wow. I said that because I immediately, because when you introduce the yes. gospel, it's tension. Yes. There and you're going to have to die to something. Yes. And I realized I use it there, and I've used it a, a hundred times since then. Yes. When I hear a conversation going, I'm like, how can I flip this to Jesus and the kingdom? Yes. And that simple tool is I just, I, I, my ears out for it. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes And immediately sense. when I do that, I'm an ambassador. I'm yes. walking in my identity. And, and Jesus said, die to yourself, deny yourself, and carry your cross. And that's at that moment when you did not even feel like talking to anyone, God came and the Holy Spirit came and stood Because you I up. died. Because Mark, you died. Mark, actually in Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 34 and 35, it says, to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross and die, die. for me yes. and the gospel, Mark 8, 34. He Amen. says you're going to have to die for me and the gospel. So yes. what does death look like? It's a death to comfort. Yes. It's a death to calendar, right? Yes. So let, what does this Absolutely. death look like? Everyone thinks it's, a, it's shedding blood, and it might actually be that in sure. Iran. But a lot of times in the West, the death is just a death to this reputation, yes. this relationship or... And that's where death has to begin before we begin shooting the gospel. And even here in the West, um, even though we talk about, you know, persecuted church in Iran, and it's far, far worse than what we experience here. Right. But 
we even here in the West have to be very careful when to talk about the gospel, when to bring God into the situation, because we have to be politically correct. Mm. And for us, there's also a level of persecution to me. Like, I can't just go to my daughter's school and just talk about how um, my life was transformed because they're like, well, wait a minute, we can't bring God to school. Why are you talking about Jesus here? Well, there's two types of persecution, and this isn't original me. In the West, we have a persecution, what I call the raised eyebrow. Yes. Oh, you're one of those. We don't want to talk about this in the, now. In the, yeah. in the East, where you're from, it's the raised fist. Wow, that's good. And so here, we get persecution in the form of reputation, yes. relationship. You're weird. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't just walk up to a... Str- I know this might sound strange. I am an introvert. Sure. I know this is going to be hard to believe. Sure. And I, I'm not someone that's known for going up to random strangers. I, I've never done that, but... But we do go into our community, like I yes. mentioned, with prayer. We always lead with prayer. Yes. And it's amazing. Can you just talk to us? I'm sorry Yeah, to no, no, this you. is a good... But I would love for our audience to hear the exact script. I know you yeah. mentioned about the 15 seconds um, sharing the gospel, but I really would love for you to tell us, okay, when you knock on people's doors, and I know this is secondary to yeah, what yeah, you do, right. but what do you exactly say? This is exact. I've done this thousands of times uh, I knock on the door and I say, hi, this is Ross, Taylor, and my wife, Jill, or whatever. And we live in this community, Mm -hmm. and uh, we've been praying over this whole area. And we thought it would just be a good idea to actually engage every home and find out how we can pray for you, find out what's going on in your life, rather than guessing. And I would say six out of ten times, I go, really? I go, yeah. So is there anything going on in your life that needs prayer? Job, health, family, anything? And what will happen is one of two things. Sometimes the minute I say prayer, and this happened two weeks ago, a lady starts crying. I don't even have to go any further. She has breast cancer, and she's like, oh, my gosh. I had the biopsy yesterday. I think God sent you to our door. And then some people go, oh, you know. And then they give us something. I had one the other day. Um, A kid is, this lady actually told us this, that the war, my son is uh, rebellious and, and all kinds of stuff. I said, well, let's pray for him. She's like, okay. We pray for him real quickly, real tight. Remember what I told you, don't do your quiet time there. Right. And we pray in Jesus' name. We come out of the prayer and we go, thank you so much for letting me pray for you. I, yes. I really do appreciate this. And then I go, you know, in this crazy time in this world, what gives you hope right now? We're just yeah. asking people. Yeah. And they go, huh, you know, um, gosh, the vaccine gives me hope or my kids give me hope. Right. I'm like, really? I go, you know. I'm out here telling a real tight, short story that gives me hope, and I go right into it. Wow. And we pull out the card. There's no name badges. We don't look like Mormons, and I go into the gospel in a very interactive, simple way. Yes. And I'm sharing the gospel with them. We end with a simple question. Where do you see yourself? And what we found is rather than going, hey, I want you to come to my church, I get into the gospel story, and we find that by getting into the gospel it's amazing what begins to pull out of their heart. Yes. And so I'm within five, four to five minutes, I'm into the message of the kingdom yes. with an absolute stranger. And I'm finding out where they are. And at the end, we ask them where they are. And again, I have so many stories I'm going to begin. Yeah. This couple, I go, where do you see yourself? And they go, oh, I see myself in brokenness. And I'm immediately into that level of with them within five minutes. This whole idea that I have to earn the right to share the gospel is not modeled anywhere Anywhere. in Scripture. In fact, what we were talking about, the total opposite is is modeled. There's very very little relationship before the message of the kingdom is shared. Now, it's great when you have relationship. Yes. But so that's what we do, and then we find out where they're at. So, Ross, um, I really... Um, I appreciate and admire the boldness. And I know the boldness that you have and the people that you are training up um, come straight from the Holy Spirit. Would you, with the little time that we have, pray for all of us and also the audience that are watching our program that they would become laborers because we all know the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. Would you please pray for us so we can also receive this type of boldness, this type of courage, and be equipped and empowered to go and make disciples? Yeah, yeah. Pray right now? All right, let me pray. Lord, um, this is your plan. This is not mine. This is your desire for every believer to be an ambassador of Christ. You told us 
that um, you gave us the message of rec- reconciliation yes. and that you've entrusted me and every believer with this incredible message. And you tell us, Lord, that it's as if you're making your uh, plea through us. Yes. I wouldn't have used me, Lord, but for whatever reason you are, and to be reconciled to Christ. And Lord, I pray that every believer would experience their identity as yes. a fisher of men, yes. as a sower, yes. as a disciple maker, and as an ambassador of Christ. Lord, yes. will you release that in, in our person, in, in, in our identity? And Lord, yes. I pray for every believer that you will bring tools yes. and processes and means yes. and training so they can realize that identity in Christ and the joy that, that comes from realizing what you made us to be, Lord. Will you, wherever they are in Iran, will you bring, in, bring tools and yes. relationships? Yes. And so, Lord, that when we stand before you, we, we can come into that spot and, and you, we will hear, well done, good and faithful yes. servant. I want to hear that. Amen. And that's not going to happen by me being passive and so, Lord, help us yes. to, to position us um, to be ambassadors of Christ and experience the joy of obedience and the joy of making your name great. Amen. And, Lord, um, may we uh, realize that's why you left us on this planet Yes, is to, to experience that. And so, uh, Lord, that is my prayer that you will raise up labors, that you'll use our efforts and my efforts and Lily's efforts and every to to raise up labors yes, for this wonderful message that you left us here. Yes, and we pray this in the precious and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ross, it was such an honor to have you, you on our program. Thank you for praying for us. And I hope that we can have you again at our studio. I'm I just, would love for us to, to kind of dig a little deeper and yeah. learn more about you. That's great. Thank you Thank so much. You. Appreciate it.